and welcome to History is Gay, a podcast that examines the underappreciated and overlooked queer ladies, gents, and gentle envies that have always been there in the unexplored corners of history. Because history has never been as straight as you think. It's Lee. Welcome back to History is Gay for another wonderful, fun episode. I'm really excited to bring this one to you. I am joined today by a wonderful guest host named Erica Friedman, who is the expert on any and everything Yuri related. I'm and actually the second <laughs> most expert in the world. There's a guy in Japan who knows more than me. Okay, so the 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 North American expert, the the North American English language expert, fair on fair. on Yuri. So, hi, Erica. How are Hello, you? Hello, Lee. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for being here. It's it was funny. Um, we we got connected in a funny way. I had original plans to do this episode like a year and a half ago with a friend who was like, "Hey, let's let's talk about this person. Let's do this thing." And it never ended up manifesting. And he was like, you know who you should reach out to is this really amazing scholar and all around amazing, knowledgeable person, Erica Friedman. And then you followed me on Twitter. I did like that (laughs) same week. Yeah. And I was like, oh, uh. And then you reached out. You're like, I have an episode idea about this really cool person. And I could not believe the... uh, the serendipity of the universe. It really was serendipity. We right? having I wrote same. you and you were like, oh my God, I was just talking about you like days ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, welcome back to the podcast. Um, today we are going to be diving into the, I mean, I think it's appropriate to call it the magical world of Yoshia Nobuko. Absolutely. Who was a Japanese writer who is, uh, essentially people call her the, the grandmother of, of Yuri. Of, That's what of that I have called her, the grandmother of Yuri. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. She was an amazing woman. Her life was honestly amazing. It's, it's one of those lives that you just marvel, and the more you learn, the more marvelous it becomes. Yeah. Um, for those who are listening, who are maybe not as steeped in the, the manga world, the anime world, could you explain a little bit about what Yuri manga is? And we're going to go lots of detail into shoujo, but, you know, just like the briefest of introductions for anybody who is very new to this world of literature. Certainly. I'm just going to real quick pull up my essay here because uh, this is what we have <laughs> on YuriCon because, and the reason I want to start with what we say on YuriCon is because the thing about Yuri is as a genre, it is one of the newest genres of Japanese pop culture. It is constantly changing for very uh, important reasons, which I'll get to in one second. And it's got different sources so that everybody has different needs and requirements from it. So this is our intentionally broad definition of the genre Yuri at YuriCon. Yuri can describe any anime or manga series or other derivative media like fan fiction, film, light novels that show intense emotional connection, romantic love, or physical desire between women. Yuri is not a genre confined by the gender or age of the audience, but by the perception of the audience. Now, just give me a moment here to clarify why that last sentence exists. In Japan, genre is defined by the age and gender of the audience. So you have shoujo, which is for girls, and jose, which is for women, and shonen, which is for boys, and seinen, which is for men. But yuri doesn't have that age or gender differentiation. So that anybody, when the it's not a joke. When you think it's yuri, it's yuri. <laughs> So here's if the I other look half at it, it. If I look at it and I think it's gay, it's gay. It's gay, right? That's the answer, right? Even if somebody says, you can't say that's gay because blah, blah, blah. Well, you know what? Actually, I can watch. I'm going to. Um, but the other <laughs> half of that... I'm rub my filthy little gay hands all over it. Um, the other half of that is that on my blog, Okazu, I have a, a working definition that's slightly different. And that is because of the perception issues. So what I say is the difference between Yuri and... LGBTQ plus content is identity. So I always joke that Yuri is lesbian content without lesbian identity. Because as soon as I see a series where the characters say, well, I'm lesbian and blah, 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 then I go, well, it's lesbian media. 
But if they're like, I like girls, or I only like women, or, you know, I'm in love with you, but I don't know what else I, if I ever liked anybody else ever, you know, all these other non-identity things, I call it Yuri. But as Yuri has developed, it's getting queer and queerer. And there's a lot more overlap. So you can get into arguments uh, about whether we should call it girls' love, which sort of positions itself as a parallel to the genre boys' love. Which boys' is love, like yeah. Male, male stuff. It's in a period of intense change right now because you have readers who are not queer enjoying it. You have readers who are queer who are creating it and enjoying it. And you have publishers who have completely different needs than those other two audiences. And then you have um, <laughs> creators who are doing their own thing with it. So these different disparate pressures change it very quickly a lot of the time. So the simple definition is it's not simple, but you can just, if you think it's eerie, it's eerie. I love that. I love that so much. <laughs> I mean, that's honestly how I approach most of my media is sure. if I feel gay or watching it, it's gay to me. I, I really enjoy it. It's just, it's very fun to... To rub your filthy little gay hands all over. Yeah, things. really. Um. Well, the thing is, if, if I see it and I, I resonate with it, and we'll talk about this later too, right? If somebody tells you, well, you can't identify that as gay because they either didn't use that word or, or didn't, you know, and yeah, actually we can because gaydar exists and it exists across time and space. And when I look at a picture of Yoshino Buko in her little butchy suit and I think, gay, <laughs> like she's totally gay. <laughs> like, there's nothing there that doesn't resonate. And mm -hmm. I don't think that anybody's saying, well, we can't consider this this thing because I say so has any real meaning. Right. Yeah. So jumping in, content warnings for this episode, there will be like brief discussion of suicide. We're going to be talking a little bit around World War II and Japan's imperialist actions during that time. We'll put all those in the show notes. So if, if you need to skip around the episode, you can look down there for those. This is going to be a people-focused episode. We're going to be talking about our social context and then dive into the world and life of Yoshio Nobuko and all the various elements of her queerness and queerness in the world around her. And as usual, we'll end the podcast with how gay were they, our personal ranking about how likely it is that they weren't straight, which is always fun. All right, so let's dive in. I'm going to give us a little bit of context for where we're dropping into the life of Yoshi Nobuko. She was born at a time when literally everything in Japan was changing an insane amount. So early 20th century Japan, we've talked about Tokugawa period before in previous episodes. We get to 20th century Japan and everything changes really rapidly. Japan broke its 200 years of isolation and opened up trade ports. Basically, some motherfucker named Commodore Perry, some <laughs> American dude, is like, hey, I'm here. Open up your ports and trade with me. Or, on my terms, because I yeah, got the on bigger my terms. ships. Because I got the I've big got, ships. I've got, the, I've got big ships. I've got big guns. Fuck you. Mm -hmm. um, say it with me. Fuck, 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 fuck colonialism. <laughs> but I want to say that that the Russians and the French and the Italians and the British were all uh, the Portuguese and the British were all just hovering. Yes. Also, yeah. it's just that America got there first, but somebody else would have done it. Right. Yeah. So you have so. this this period of like 200 years of Japan being very insular, having a very closed borders and closed culture society. And then suddenly Westerners are like flooding in. And Japan embraced it because they, they saw what happened to China during the British occupation and went, hmm. You know what we could do? We could modernize right now. We're going to embrace this international economic stage. And I think this is an important thing because a lot of people write about it and say, well, you know, when their doors were forced open and sure, the door might have been forced open, but then they were like, you know what? We're doing this. And we and they the doors did open. It. The doors open. We're doing this. And that's why everything was changing so rapidly because they were embracing Western technology and science and medicine and absorbing it and integrating it as quickly as possible, but also sending their own people out to Western schools, to uh, mm -hmm. England and to the US and, and sending people to come back with Western ideas of technology and travel and, and all this other stuff. So and they, they really mobilized quickly and moved unbelievably quickly. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think it, it's an insane amount of change in an insane amount of time. You had people, you know, who were like, also, you know, fuck this shogunate 
<laughs> I'm, I'm done. I'm done with this. And so you have 1867, Emperor Meiji comes to power, basically says, goodbye, shoguns. The imperial family is now in charge again. Which was a civil war. And we don't, they don't talk about it like a civil war, but when you're looking at it, there was a civil war. Right. Yeah. And so you literally have this period less than 20 years because Emperor Meiji dies in 1912. And you get a new emperor, so now you have this this Taisho period. So we're we're working in this conversation here. We're like itty bitty bit in Meiji period, and then Taisho, and everything in the period of like you know late eighteen hundreds to nineteen hundred. Everything had modernized, and like you were saying, Western literature was everywhere. Scientific methodology was everywhere. All the work of the sexologists yeah. uh, in in the Western world coming over to Japan, which we will talk about in detail. In Things a, like Alice in Wonderland and the Little Princess, all these all these bits of Victorian literature that show up and just really make such an impact. Mm -hmm. Even though Japan is like modernizing, Confucian values uh, still kind of hold really strong, especially in ways that Japanese officials were like, all right, here's our roles for men and women. Uh, imagine like Confucian <laughs> gender roles and Victorian gender roles smushing together. Smushing that's together, kind of, yeah. That's kind of what you get. And I mean, it's that's not really just sexism. Is let's, let's be honest. So sexism still ruled and they got a little bit more sexist. Yeah, yeah. You've got the, the Civil Code of 1898 basically uh, established this like new family system. And it was, you know, hey, the household is really important. Individuality, not so much. And woman be domestic. Woman be in kitchen. Yep. Woman hang out in the house. Do you want to talk a little bit about Rusai Kembo? No, I think you're doing really good. <laughs> I'm gonna. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I mean, sure. But the thing is, I don't want to. If I talk about Rusai Kembo, which is good wife, wise mother, I'm not going to be kind about it, right? So. <laughs> The fact is that that at about this time there was a state there was this official state policy in the late 1800s and early 1900s that established this concept of the good wife wise mother, which has I don't know what's the name of that insect that takes over ants uh, the fungus that takes over ants bodies and and oh uses them. yeah it's a lot like that this is how I feel about it like this <laughs> this ideal of of women being completely self sacrificial for their children their male children and their husbands endlessly and being supportive of the state as another male partnership, really, you know, the, the patriarchal state is also watching over you. And at the, at the risk of women's lives, at the, at the, the sacrifice, the full sacrifice of women's lives, I don't think is a, a policy that offered any particularly positive qualities if you're a woman. And yet, we still see relics of it floating through modern thought in Japanese policymaking. Mm -hmm. And it was hugely influential in terms of the way that we are going to be discussing the ways that women were just navigating the world. Yes. And, and the choices uh, they were given. And the choices they were given and the choices they made. Yeah. yeah. The choices they made as opposed to the choices they, the, they were actually not given. And I think in a lot of ways in the way uh, Yoshinobuko saw what she needed to be doing. You know, that there's, there's this ideal and she had this idea of a uh, different ideal of what women could be capable of. Well, she was not the only one, right? right. So you have, uh, this is a time where we have a lot of feminism really cropping up, especially in this group called uh, the Blue Stockings Group or Seitosha. So it basically started with a journal, a magazine called Seito. And Blue Stockings by... was based on a group of the same name here in the West. Oh, okay. I there was, didn't a, it was that. And the thing that I think is so important. Tell this, me more. Tell okay, me, this tell is the me thing about that is, the Blue Stockings. Well, I don't really know a lot about the Western Blue Stockings other than they exist. But here's the important point. I think when we talk about this as feminist thought, and it is feminist thought, what I want to say is that it's feminist thought that is rooted in literary concepts. It's women creating things for themselves and above all, making sure their own voices and their own stories are being heard. So when in Japan they created Blue Stockings, it was, it was primarily it was primarily a literary journal, mm -hmm. you know, with women writing things and, and creating stuff for themselves to have their own voices being heard. And I think that theme will come up over and over and over as we go through her life is this idea of every generation finding a new way to say, hey, our voices aren't being heard. They need to be heard. And then, of course, the new laws that always sort of go, oh, yeah, so we'll listen to you later. But then right now we're going to listen only then, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a very interesting thing where it's, it's really a literary proto-feminism. Let's call it that. 
Yeah, so it's started by Hiratsuka Raicho uh, in 1911, and it's it has tons of women's writing, and it's also translating a lot of things coming over and influencing proto-Japanese feminist thought. Right. Um, you've got things like Henrik Ibsen's play A Doll's House was really popular. A lot of these these Super women who were in, indoctrinated in good wife, wise mother were really, really excited by this story of this Scandinavian housewife going, no, fuck you, I leave. I'm I, leaving, I'm you, walking away. You, take care of the children. I'm running away. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't read A Doll's House, honestly, you should. Honestly, if you, you should, if, yes. If you want to see a Victorian fuck you to Victorian gender roles, <laughs> Nora in... It, it, there's a reason why it's so influential everywhere around the world. I'm a theater nerd. It's great. Um, they also, like, publish sexological texts, and this will become really important when we talk about queerness, is that, like, this is this was one of the first places that a lot of Japanese women were reading about sexological texts on women, women relationships or, or women's um, desire at all that, that you know that, that, that in general that surprising idea that women also have sexual desire oh my god what do we do with it <laughs> what? how do we stop this you know we've never encountered that in this never ever it podcast just... ever so I, it was it was not very long lived it was basically from 1911 to 1916 mm -hmm. but there's this really great quote in Raicho's like manifesto when creating the journal that was uh, this is the first cry of the blue stockings we are the mind and the hand of the woman of new japan that's lovely so it's that's the way to kind of take it in is is you've got this group of women who were like all right time to write about ourselves and in addition to, you know, women, grown-ass women, <laughs> you have this rise of girls' schools and with it, girls' culture. So with the Meiji Restoration, with the Civil Code, with, with all this rapid industrialization that's happening, you have one of the things that came about is compulsory education. Right. So you had all of these kids. The creation required... of adolescence. Yes. Yeah. So you have this and it, you know, it was it was influenced in some ways by like American girls culture, which was in the zeitgeist and basically crossed over to Japan and they created their own version of the phenomenon. It started out as like an imitation and developed its own uniquely Japanese version, which we call shoujo bunka. Is but also girls, there's, a, girls culture. there's another thing that's happening there because as I said, when Japan opened its doors, started sending people out to other countries and other cultures to learn, one of the things it wanted to do was kind of understand what they were doing and things like, what does education look like in America? What does education look like mm -hmm. in Britain and France? And to assist with that, they brought in experts from those countries. And so a lot of the schools that were created were run, particularly for the upper middle class, were run by um, Western religious affiliations. And that took on very specific forms and so not only was the, the girls' culture created based on, you know, the idea that now now we are all a bunch of young women in one place, which creates a whole lot of pressures and, and interesting situations, but also this idea that, you know, there's an acknowledgement by the... Um, but the powers that be, that sexuality is is happening, adolescence is happening, and how do we stop it is also a very important thing. You know, how do we make sure that these girls don't run out and get pregnant or, you know, do other things? And when you combine that with the, the kohai senpai system that, that is existing in, in schools in Japan and now in businesses as well, you get this idea of, you know, older girls taking younger girls under their wing to show them how the school works and give them, you know, allies and so a confidant. And that begins to morph into what we think of as girls' culture. And then... You have girls' <laughs> magazines giving a focus for that. And the thing about the girls' magazines is that they seem like they're really organic, right? Because the girls are writing the magazines and telling them stories. But it's not. It's a bunch of guys who said, you know, we should do, we should, we should try to sell stuff to girls. So they would write stories and they'd write fake letters to each other like, oh, you know, I was at school and I saw this older student and she was so beautiful, right? And, and so then real girls were like, oh my God, me too. And then they started writing in these <laughs> really passionate letters to each other and saying, you know, my, my Onesama, my older sister is the most beautiful woman. And when she stands there and, you know, she I, and looks, she's just so, so elegant and these incredibly uh, passionate romantic uh, letters to each other. And then they started writing stories. And so while the men were or the initial editors, the content started coming from the girls and young women who were reading the magazines. And among them was Yoshio Nabuko. Yes, I know, you're like, you're skipping, you're skipping so far ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 
<laughs> you're giving away the good. You're giving away the good stuff too early. Yeah, um, yeah. You have this this emergence of these magazines, basically the the creation of young girl as consumer, as consumer, uh, as soon this, as possible. I, Let's get that I, going I think, as soon as possible. Yeah, I think we I think we like really kind of skimmed over it there, but you have this creation of this like liminal adolescent identity. So we're going to be bringing up this word shoujo throughout the whole episode, and it means you know literally like transliterated. It's like maiden or girl well there's two different you'll... words let's be very clear shoujo which with a longer o shoujo is girl shoujo with a short o is maiden or virgin so it's, okay. it's not the same word but basically you know not yet a woman yeah um hasn't married hasn't had children you haven't entered into the realm of adult reality and responsibilities and right. with that heterosexuality before this time, adolescence wasn't really a thing in Japan. Um, or and anywhere, of, really. And this, this shoujo period, this adolescence, gives like a middle ground between puberty and marriage. And we see at this time, it keeps extending mm -hmm. as more women join the workforce. So it could, you know, include not just girls who were like actively in these girls' schools, but also women who were just unmarried or women with privilege to not have to financially depend on good wife, wise mother to survive. And you mentioned before, there's an important class component here is that these girls' schools were primarily made up of upper middle class girls. So, you know, shoujo bunka was kind of like more of a, a leisure class thing. You see it in some other areas, but we, we re I read in a couple of sources that like working class, lower class girls, factory workers often didn't recognize themselves as shoujo. As like, shoujo. Like having... But they had the magazines so that they could fantasize about it. And mm -hmm. that's really important as well. These girls magazines did commoditize girls, but also gave them a place for them to express themselves. And so while, yes, of course, shoujo, as with pretty much any kind of culture, shoujo bunka started with more well-off, more stable, privileged girls, the magazines gave a chance for other girls to be part of that world, even if it was only while they were reading it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a really great quote from one of the sources we read, we'll, we'll link it in the show notes, um, that basically this this space of, of girls' culture, the space of shoujo bunka, was an independent community for girls, free from intrusion by male educational codes or standards. So you have this, this emergence of this space that is theirs. It's theirs. And this space in these magazines that is theirs extends out into the schools themselves and the entire subculture that kind of erupts from all of this. Um, Absolutely. These, and these that's girls... very typical of girls in every generation. Every generation, young girls make their own culture. It eventually gets appropriated by the larger, cu the culture at large. And then everyone worries about the girls because, oh my God, they're, you know, they're wearing makeup or they're doing whatever. They're hanging out in Shibuya and eat, drinking tapioca, you know, tapioca tea or whatever. But, but we, and every generation does exactly the same thing. Like the girls create the culture, the culture create, uh, is appropriated. And then we, then we start sort of diminishing the girls experience with it, you know? Every single time, over and over and over. And the, the the nature of the stories that are in these these girls' magazines is girls' stories were usually like dreamy and fantasy, yes. and these boys' stories were adventure stories and kind of more nationalistic messages. And the, the girls' stories were nationalistic in in a different way. In a different way, yeah. you know. Let's let's not sugarcoat that. But it's it's you have this kind of like this liminal space of adolescence, um, and it's a place for to fantasize about love without necessarily being involved in romance with boys, you know, because mm -hmm. a lot of these girls, I mean, let's be honest, some of them, have, you know, if you didn't have a, a brother at home, you didn't see boys, you know, in these schools and in your homes. And you had this place where you could say, I want to be a woman like my own Aesama. Well, speaking of young Japanese girls looking at uh, someone they would like to be like, uh, looking up to as, as a, a role model. Let's dive in to Yoshinobuko Excellent. herself. So she was born January 12th, 1896. This is the year after the end of the Sino-Japanese War. And her parents were a police official who then becomes like a government official father. Her mother was a housewife. They're pretty conservative. Uh, she's born in Niigata Prefecture. And both of her parents came from samurai families. So they, they're they pretty comfortable. They're in this nice they financial are the establishment. position. They are the establishment. And the household kind of held on to these 
earlier feudal ideals. So she's the only girl among four brothers, basically only girl in the family, a lot of pressure. Mom tries to drill into her this Ryosa Kembo ideals. You know, she teaches her how to sew and cook and she really loved to read, but mom is like, nope, you're going to read these books on how to sew and cook instead of like novels. And she says that she was really influenced by the girls' magazines because her brothers had the boys' magazines. There's a really lovely quote from her. She says, I was so happy because my older brothers had a subscription to a magazine called Shonen Sakai, which is Boys World, and I would have to steal it to read whatever they left it unread on a desk. I remember being so happy when I could finally read the girl's version and have it all to myself. And she describes like, like she, she like held it so tightly and caressed it with her fingers. And she, she saw the stack of the magazines grow on her desk and she was so satisfied by it. So th- these really held a lot of importance to yeah, her absolutely. growing up. Right, but yeah. again, it, it immediately called, gave her her own space, one that she didn't have to share with any of her brothers, but also one that she could be really deeply embedded in. And so, as I said, she was first published when she was only 12 years old. So she's writing stories uh, in 1908, sending them into magazines. And so she sent a reader submission to girls magazine Shoujo Sekai, which is Girls World, as said Shoujo Notomo. And Shoujo Notomo just existed for a really long time. And you'll see a lot of influential writers in the mid 20th century. And Shoujo Kai, which is Girls Realm. And from there, she was writing uh, reader submissions and actually wrote for a literary magazine by 17 years old. And Mm -hmm. uh, she actually won first place in a girls' fiction contest sponsored by literary magazine Girls World. Yeah, she, you know, she moved really quickly from, like, submitting amateur, amateur, quote-unquote, reader submissions to, like, really wanting to pursue, I'm going to be published in these literary magazines, I'm going to be a writer. That was, she was absolutely, you know, committed to it. This was not like a, well, you know, I'll be a singer, no, I'll be a writer, no, I'll be an actress, you know, this was like, I'm going to be a writer. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so she, basically her father gets transferred to a different post and she's like, I don't want to go live out in the country. I don't want to be stuck in my parents' house with all of these rules. So she moves to Tokyo in in 1915 to live with her youngest brother, Tadaki, who basically he's like the one family member who actually supported her writing. Yeah, he got her. He got her, really. He got her. He definitely got her. He's friends with this pretty prolific artist, Takahisa Yumeji. And basically, Yumeji sends a letter to Yoshinobuko. It's like, hey, uh, I hear you're doing all this cool writing and I do cool art. Let's get together and do some sort of collaboration. And so, you and know. She was, that was really cool because he was really a, a super influential artist. And uh, even now, the Yayoi Yumeji Museum, which is two artists, Yumeji and his friend Yayoi, their houses were next to each other. They've turned both houses into a museum have a ton of Yoshinobuko stuff. Um, but the thing is, Yumeji himself kind of annoyed Nobuko. She, yeah. <laughs> she didn't really like the way he ran his life. You know, he was having affairs with other women, not, you know, and, and sort of ignoring his wife. But she thought, well, he's a means to an end, so sure. This we'll, is my chance. This will collaborate. Absolutely. Yoshinobuko is uh, Alexander Hamilton, not mm-hmm. throwing away my shot. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yep. Yeah. So during her first year in Tokyo, she begins writing this series of stories, this Hanamonogatari mm-hmm. or Flower Tales. She submits it to Shoujo Gabo in 1916, and it runs for the next eight years. And this is the thing that propelled her into fame. She serializes it, this story through 1924. So it's something that she's working on, you know, for quite some time. This series of stories is basically these 52 stories, all named after flowers. So I can only imagine what <laughs> what the flowers were by the end of that, you know. Uh, you know, they're, um, they're all pretty standard, but but it's, it's um, they're very much about girls in that liminal space. Mm-hmm. They're very, very much. And they start really interestingly because they start with a group of, of older women, like middle-aged women, talking, saying, oh, I remember when I was in school, let me tell you a story. So there's like a framing mm. quality about a th- Two-thirds of the way, that disappears, and it's just one story after another story. So the framing story sort of falls apart, and then it's just these stories, and they are... It's like a lot of realism. It's a lot of harshness. It's a lot of death and and a, a loss. And you mm-hmm. feel them. I mean, you feel every one of these stories in a very real way, in a way that you might not feel if you're just reading stories about school life, that liminal life. Right. 
Yeah. So this this is really, really influential, and we're going to return back to it because it is, it's absolutely genre-defining. It is. So she starts this. She she lives with her brother for a little while. Her brother gets a job in North China for, I think I think he did something with trees. I can't remember. It was um, something agricultural. But basically, mm-hmm. he's like, all right, I got to go to North China. And she's like, well, cool. Um, I'm going to stay in Tokyo. I'm not moving back in with mom and dad. And so she moves to this women's dorm in Yotsuya district, which is basically it's it's like run by American Baptist missionaries. And that's where she starts learning English. She does not stay there for very long because apparently she really liked going to the uh, movies, the mo- going to the movies, going out. staying out late, yeah. hanging out with people. She kept missing her curfew. Yeah, yeah, they had a really strict curfew. So she's like, well, <laughs> I don't like this anymore. So she she moves to the YWCA. So, you know, women's equivalent of the YMCA in Kanda district. And and there she meets Kikuchi Yukie, who is her roommate, which uh, if that's pinging some things for you, uh, hold roommate. tight. <laughs> hold tight. Um, <laughs> she basically, th- this this girl becomes a model for, honestly, a couple of different characters in, her in a work, couple of yeah, her different absolutely. stories. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she also, it was important to note that Yoshia was was a reader of that Saito magazine right. that we talked about earlier, and that she did, like, actually attend a few meetings of the Blue Stockings. Right. She publishes in 1919 one of her other really seminal texts. So they, she published Yana Uru no Nishoujo, which is Two Maidens in the Attic. It was a book that I and other scholars consider the prototype of, the fir- of Yuri, where you have two young women in a uh, fraught situation, a uh, very emotional situation in a, in a girl's school, and they are put in an attic room apart from everyone else. And that room becomes a focal point for the development of not only just their relationship, but of the main character's whole personality. And she comes to the, Akiko, who is the protagonist, comes to the YWCA, and or the YCA, and she is so reticent that it literally takes her, and I joke about this all the time, she literally takes three pages to open a door in the beginning of the book. <laughs> and at the end of the book, when Akitsu turns to her and says, come with me to the outside world, and it's, Delasse talks about that as, as a social and political awakening, but there's other stuff going on there too, because there's a very physical and very emotional relationship between them. That whole story is like watching Akiko develop deeply. And the fact that she was apart from everybody at first is a real problem, then it becomes a refuge. Mm -hmm. Even as she becomes more capable of building relationships with the people around her and understanding who she is as a person. So it gives her refuge from the turmoil within and then gives her the strength to be able to walk away with Akitsu in a way that is a choice and an act of choice by the both of them to say, we're not going to go do the things that we're being required to do. Mm-hmm. It was a great book. I wish more of her stuff was translated. Yeah, well, you know, I, we haven't mentioned her yet, but I think I'm just going to run in right now. A lot of what we're really waiting for right now is the book by Sarah Frederick. Uh, Dr. Sarah Frederick is a um, assistant professor over at Boston University. She's a, a friend of mine, and I did a video with her about Yushin Nibuko, which we'll have in the com- in the. Uh, show notes. She is hoping to do a biography of her soon, and she's trying very hard to get more of her work in English. And of course, I'm raw rawing that because I would like to see more of her work in English. <laughs> yeah, this is a really interesting person that we're, we're covering because I think you said this when we were talking is like, we know a lot about her without really knowing a lot about her. That is exactly um, it. It's, we have hearsay, we have things that have been translated and then passed down and things that have been kind of repeated in the same articles, etc. But there hasn't been a big comprehensive, at least English language, look into her life. There is one, there is one in Japanese, but there is not one in in English. And so I'm really hoping that Sarah can can get that out in the next right. couple of years and so we'll have like the book the big book of Yoshi and Ibuko, you know? so one limitation i'll say for our research is that you know we are dealing with translations we are dealing with um you know interpretation uh, interpretation and english language sources so there's a level of disconnect there that we're not you know getting things in the original japanese and even if we do um, we're getting things that are still interpretations and then there's the whole issue, and I, I'm sorry I'm jumping a little bit, but um, the issue that she was often diminished as an author by contemporary critics, need I say contemporary male critics, 
yeah. um, who did not recognize that popular fiction. You know, there's that we get it here in America too. That popular fiction versus literary fiction thing. Mm-hmm. And if it's not literary fiction, amazingly, no woman has ever written a literary fiction. It's like weird, right? <laughs> it's it's like the bizarre thing. Like no women write literary fiction. We only write genre fiction, but men write literary fiction. And that's the same thing that happened to her. Which is so funny because literally at this time, right, like around two maidens or two virgins in the attic, she's describing the work she's writing at this time. She's, mm-hmm. she's trying to go for a little bit of an older audience. She starts describing this as part of the quote unquote pure literature genre. This, yeah. Uh, Jun Bukaku, yeah. Yeah, and you have this dichotomy between, like, sugary and, like, domestic and girls' literature and, like, the pure literature. She, and, uh, she you know, wa- and the, the difference is, like, and you can see it in her writing. When you talk about pure literature, you're talking about things that are so- socially and politically aware. They're set in our world. They're set in reality. And Hanumanogatari is a huge move towards that. And most of the stories, even the ones that are set in the girls' schools, they shift at the end. Like, and then the real world comes and, you know, stomps down this beautiful relationship or this charming young lady and sets her into the real world. And I think that that's what Hanuman Katari does as such a, a generational change. It's like, yes, it's liminal, but at some point you have to leave the liminality. And then when you get to the real world, this is what it looks like. Right. Yeah. She also wrote a couple of other things right in this this year in 1919 that really became hits and, and kind of made her like commercially successful novelist, which um, this woman ended up rich, really, rich. really well, really, really, really rich. well off. There was a point at which I think she I think I read that she was like making three times as much as the prime minister. Yes, that is correct. Which is crazy. She basically in 1921 cuts her hair to this like short haircut. It's it's, it's very really boyish. it's very boyish. It's I mean it's like it's like an elevated bowl cut basically. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh But it was kappa. cute on her. She looked yeah, adorable. It's very cute. She's like one of the first women to do this even though it was banned by it was Japanese technically law. against the law, yeah. Not really enforced, but, you know, whatever. And she has this same hair for the rest of her life, and she never went back to longer styles. It is at this point that she starts also dressing in more masculine clothing, and she's really starting to develop this, like, butchy appearance, yeah, which is just absolutely. really lovely. And she she was in a series of romantic relationships with other women as early as 1918. We'll talk about those soon. And while she was, like, never secretive about it, she was always very open about it, the physical aspects, you know, women's sexual desire... Not really something that you talked about. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, we learn about these aspects of her life, not necessarily through her writing either, because a lot of it is very chaste. We learn about these things from, like, private letters. Private letters, uh, yeah, private letters were were much steamier, yeah. (laughs) Yes. Namely, (laughs) many of her letters are from and to this woman, Mon Machio, who is the greatest love of her life. Yes. They meet in January 1923. She's three years older than Monma. She's 27 at this time. Monma's 24. They get introduced by a friend and they begin living together in 1926 and passionately in love. We're going to talk more about them in their whole whole section. Yes. Um, but she basically meets this person and the entire rest of her life is involved with this person. Right. Do you want to talk about Black Rose a little bit? So in 1925, she founded her own literary magazine. And I wanted to say that again, because once again, we're talking about this proto-feminist idea of using literary effort to discuss identity and, and social aspects and political pieces, because these literary magazines, um, which still exist. And uh, can I just do a quick digression? There's a whole gigantic culture in Japan of what's called doujinshi. And doujinshi are coterie magazines. They are groups of people called circles. And you get together and for at least a while you work on this magazine. So doujinshi don't necessarily exist for very long. But they are exactly like if you were ever the member of the church group and you joined the newsletter and then you were the editor for the newsletter for a couple of years and then you walked away and then that newsletter dies and then maybe a couple of years later somebody else brings it back that's very much what doujinshi look like so this culture is already established back in the early 20th century with these ideas these groups of like-minded people getting together and doing newsletters or magazines so she mostly was running uh, black rose by herself and and as she, every other editor who's ever done that <laughs> and i am one of them she only lasted eight issues <laughs> because you're just doing too much 
So that was dissolved. So Monma and Yoshia, they build a new house in a Tokyo suburb in 1926 for them to basically move in and live together. This is the first of eight houses that eight Yoshia houses, built. Right? I mean, and we say built, but, you know, she paid people to build them. Um, but but, but she, this is unheard of. Yeah. She's like, cool, I want a house. Let's make one over here. Yeah. She's one of the first Japanese women to have a privately owned car. She owns six racehorses. She was making more money than the prime minister. She loved golf. Traveled the a, world several traveled times. Traveled the world. Very, very well-off, successful woman. They shared a house with two maids and a German shepherd. And I wish that I knew what that doggy's name was. Yeah, I've never um, seen the name. Yeah. At this time, she starts writing stories aimed a little bit more at like housewives and an adult audience. Basically, it, she's taking the audience that started with, with her and Monogatari. 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 And is becoming older and she's like, ah, well, here you go. You know, like like some, you know, how some people like kind of grew up with different stories is this is what's happening. And that's actually happening. You're seeing, I'm seeing that now in the Yuri genre as well, because when people who started with Sailor Moon back in the 90s, they became Yuri Mangaka in the, like the 2000s and 2010s. And now they're getting to be middle aged and they're writing stories about older women. And you're starting mm. to see some stories about seniors popping up. And it's like, well, duh. because <laughs> I'm going to follow this author. Oh, uh, and also you. As an as a creator, you don't want to keep writing about fifteen year olds for the rest of your life. Right. You know, at some point, it doesn't feel right to you. It doesn't feel valid, and and you have to move yourself forward, and your characters have to move forward, and you need to talk about things that are more important to people, um, more like you. Uh, 1927, 1928, they, they basically spend like a whole year traveling west, going all over Europe. They stayed in Paris for a long time, visited the U.S. Yoshia really wanted to go to Russia because, like, that's where a revolution happened. And while they're there, they rendezvous with two other women uh, Japanese writers who were very gay together. Mm -hmm. um, and, like, these two women become another really important part of, like, Japanese feminist literary canon. We don't have time to go into them, but basically just gal palling around with them in Moscow. As one does. As, as one does, having a wonderful time. And then World War II. Right. And prior to World War II. And prior to World War II. So Yushi and Nabuko became everything. part of what's known as the Penbutai, the Pen Corps, a journalistic propaganda unit who, um, she was a quote unquote special correspondent for Shufu no Tomo, housewife's friend, and she was writing from China and, and specifically Manchuria and some Indonesia and Thailand, Vietnam and other areas that were occupied by Japan. Um, and it's very important to note that she wasn't the only feminist writer to support the military regime, but there weren't a lot of options also, very likely she saw this as a chance to be res more respected as a writer, to, to lift herself up into a higher echelon of the only woman among a much more uh, special group of men. So it's right. very possible that was the case. And she did, she absolutely wrote imperialistic propaganda. There is no question she upheld state directives and uh, she definitely also made up a story in her head about like this was a way for Japanese women and Chinese women to reach out to each other and somehow, mm -hmm. you know, make a, um, a connection, even though clearly that was not going to be a thing that was would be allowable by an imperialistic society. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of this stuff at this time is the government was like, not quite sure about having her be part of the Pencor in yeah. some ways. They're like, I don't know if all of your feminist messaging is what we need right now, but you're also like really popular. She was really so popular. <laughs> let's have you let's have you write a play for basically let's have you do USO shows and, you yeah. know, be our very popular girls writing mascot to get all of the housewives really supporting Military, nationalistic fervor, nationalistic yeah. exactly yeah yeah um and you know there's there's uh we'll put in the show notes like there's plenty of really great articles bringing up this complexity in her supporting these messages and some of the pushback from writers at the time as well who were some of the people who kind of did stay a little bit on the more critical side it was really hard in japan at the time to write something that the censors didn't agree with yeah you know. exactly 
And she was also serializing novels in the newspapers, as well as mm -hmm. the propaganda that she was writing. She was, she was um, as you said, she had moved towards more domestic kate. Domestic is uh, sort of like, you know, two housewives. Um, mm -hmm. You'll still hear like... Two housewives. You know, house? two housewives. It's things <laughs> things to do to housewives. Like, like kate ruri is like domestic cooking, as opposed to like mm -hmm. cooking in a restaurant or whatever. Um, she started taking on historical novels. And one of the things she was doing at the time, and she was serializing these in newspapers, Papers, and I want to really keep beating that point to death because newspapers were an incredibly popular way of distribution of information and therefore and entertainment. And so imagine if ever, pretty much every adult in Japan is reading the newspaper, and that newspaper includes a story centering women's experiences. Um, so these became so incredibly popular. This is what wasn't like, you know, they put these stories in there and people were like, ew, what's this? People were like eating it up. So in 1939, she had a story called The Women's Classroom. It was 212 serialized chapters Jesus in two Christ. major newspapers. I mean, that's not something that, that's being ignored, right? That's men and women reading and going, wow, what's the next chapter? Uh, mm -hmm. There was a novel edition. It had two stage plays and, and had two films made of it. In 1946, which is now we're jumping a bit post-war, the Ataka family, which was a novel of hers that was also serialized, sold 5 million copies. And she was the highest ranked women writer in a poll in the Mainichi Shimbun, which is the, the daily paper, of who is your favorite writer after the incredibly world-famous Natsume Soseki. So Soseki is so famous that he is even translated into English. Like, I am a cat is the thing that people know here. So it's a hugely popular writer, and she was number two. So, I mean, this was a woman who really had her work being seen by nearly everyone, nearly every adult in Japan at this point. Mm, amazing. Yeah. After the war, she's back at, back in Japan. She's no longer traveling with the Pen Corps. She and Monma move again. Yoshia, uh, I couldn't find a lot on this, but basically after the war, she like, She's still writing, she's still writing these serialized stories, but she also develops this like passion for haiku and she studies with this poet and novelist, uh, Takahama Kiyoshi. Couldn't find any of her, her poetry. I really wish that, you know, I could have seen, seen some of her haikus. We're going to talk about this more. 1957, she formally adopts Mon Machio so she can be named as her successor. 50s and 60s, she's still writing. She starts, you know, she's focusing more on these historical novels, partially just to be like, hey, shitty male writers who say that I can't write this pure literature and grounded in reality, screw you. Um, <laughs> 1962, she builds another house in this neighborhood called Kamakura, where she and Chio lived until her death. The house is now a museum. It's open, what, like twice a year? It's, yeah, there's like, it's open to the public twice a year. So when she died... She set the gave the museum to Kamakura to become a, a resource center for women. And so they opened it to the public. And I was very, very, very lucky a few years ago to be able to go and see it. They, like, preserved her, like, study. Like, yeah, her study and her living room. You can't get into the bedrooms, but, like, the main parts of the house oh. and... Uh, it's a beautiful house, and it's uh, you could really s imagine just the two of them sitting there, uh, opening the shoji and just looking out on their beautiful garden, and just sitting there sipping their tea and just being like, "Yeah, this is really lovely." <laughs> you know, just this like is, being this happy together, you know. Yeah, uh, so they're you know they're living happily. They're basically just enjoying kind of older age. Yoshia's health declines shortly after the move. She'd had like gastrointestinal problems for years that she hadn't really looked into really extensively. She is diagnosed with metastatic colon cancer in May 1972. And I, I read something, but I couldn't find much more about it that um, I guess Mon Machio kind of kept that diagnosis from her. Yes, um, didn't tell her. That's actually yeah. not entirely unknown at the time. And there was a, a, for a very long time, Japanese doctors would not tell the patient, they'd only tell the family. Mm. So it's very yeah. possible that the doctor simply, that, that we just didn't tell her, they don't want you to, don't want you to get upset. Right. And so, you know, yeah, and Chio is like, I don't want to tell you that you're going to die. I mean, they can't really um, do anything about it, so. Yeah, can't do anything about it. Um, but sh she knew, you know, based on her will and, you know, what she was leaving to, you know, so... She dies a, a year after getting diagnosed, a little little more than a year. Uh, so she passed away July 11th, 1973, at the age of 77. 
All right. So, you know, you might have a few guesses about why we're talking about this person, but why do we think they're gay? I don't know. Who's so hard to tell? <laughs> hmm. Uh, well, before we get into, like, actually, hey, Yoshia is living with a woman for 50 years. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about the influence of Western literature and sexology on Japan and what is happening in terms of, oh, hey, sometimes women... Want to have sexy times with other, other women. women. You have these these works of Western sexologists, you know, our, our good old buddies, <laughs> Kraft Ebbing, Havelock Ellis. All of these are translated into Japanese. And you have a huge cadre of Japanese sexologists popping up and basically becoming authorities. I use that, you know, scare authorities, quotes. Authorities, right. Um, yeah. Writing on issues of sexuality and same-sex love and... I, I'm going to say lesbianism, even though, like, lesbian is not a word that was used in Japan until the 1970s. You have this kind of, say, this visibility of this. Suddenly, the social imagination is like, <gasps> what? Lesbians exist? Yeah. Um, and, you know, like I was saying before, like, sexology writing was everywhere. It was in both academic spaces and mainstream spaces. Uh, Saito published the first Japanese translation of Ellis's studies in the psychology of sex, specifically sexual inversion in women. And what's really important at this time is that 1910s, 1920s, we have the creation or the kind of restructuring of specific terms describing female same-sex love, separating it out from male-male love. Previously, you had this word, dosei, which was used for both men and women. And previously. it still is. It is, and it's it is it's essentially is. the equivalent of homosexuality. Yes. Yeah. It literally just means like same love. Dose is same sex, like same gender, I guess. And mm. then I is, is in this case, one of the two forms of love. And it's the one that we would use for romantic love. And you have this moral dichotomy created by sexologists at this time. And we've seen this in other places, too. They create these, like, two subcategories of yep. dosei, right? This ome and esu. Right. So they have this esu, or s-class, which we're going to talk about very shortly, is this pure, chaste, romantic friendships, yes. loving your friend. Romantic, platonic romance. Platonic romance. Practicing for marriage. Right, it's exactly. part of natural development. You know, yes. we've we've talked about this multiple times. If you and your gal pal want to love each other, it's all a-okay as long as you're just preparing for marriage. Right, exactly. It's, right? But this is the this is the crime, until very recently, the crime of lesbianism was having an identity. Yes. Right? The moment you say, I want to have a relationship with this other person, I am gay, they are gay, me and this other person are going to live together as a couple, we are family, people freak out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have this, this other category that sexologists created called Ome. Which is basically butch femme, butch, butch femme, femme yeah. dynamics. It was it was woman husband and woman wife, right? This stereotype of this masculine woman possessive and controlling the other woman, and it's, which is it's a real tell about how they think about how men are, right? Tell, like that's yeah. like talk about telling on themselves. <laughs> Yeah, it's this, I mean, we see this over and over is as soon as somebody, quote unquote, imitating a man, right. threatening the patriarchy, saying, ah, I'm introducing a phallus into this situation, it becomes threatening. It becomes so threatening. it's it's where you have this other type of relationship as a natural part of development. You have this, which is degeneracy and inver inversion and deviance. Which is um, really funny because when uh, Yuri was getting really popular in the 1990s, Americans did this to Yuri. They were like, well, there's shoujo eye, which is really sweet and pure. And there's Yuri, which is like sex for guys. It's porn. And ah. I was like, that's nobody think. Why would you do that? Like, why would you <laughs> as a fan insist on a moral code for this? And yet they did it all over again. Right. Like, it's right. just, it's like this, it's almost people can't stop themselves. Like, right. Yeah. And we, we have some, some translated language here. So there's this from Fujo Shinbun, which is women's newspaper. As a result of our studies, we can say that there are two kinds of same sex love. One is a pure yet passionate form of friendship, whereas the other is the so called ome relationship, <laughs> which so is a kind of female husband and wife couple. The former, there's nothing in this relationship that is shameful or despicable. But as for the latter Ome relationship, this is a truly strange phenomenon. And it is probably a phenomenon of disease. So you can see this this language. The, the pathologizing of lesbianism is, at this time period of time, of course, 
Uh, everybody is familiar with how Freud pathologized his own daughter, even, yeah. who was very gay. Yeah. And there's, there's like, in some spaces, you know, you see these, like, supposed misfortunes or worries is, you know... Seem all the time. If, if women have sex with other women, so many things will happen to your body. If you upset the, the masculine-feminine roles, you know, you're going to have vaginal cramps, frigidity, right. yeah. withering of the genitals. Right. You're going to want to commit suicide. You're going to be a criminal. It, like, nothing new. Right. It's like, so far as to, quote-unquote, experts would, like, draw up... And pu- and publish them in these magazines, these checklists for like parents and teachers to be like. Do your right, children? Cool. Yeah. Do you know where your children are? Are they gal palling or are they sexy timing? Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> right. Like they read like. Do you remember when teenagers were wearing like silly bands or yeah, whatever, yeah, or like yeah. slap bracelets, and yeah. they're like, it's a bit, oh, bit God, after my it, time. But if I they remember. wear this, if they wear this color, that means they're having sex. It was literally like that. Yeah. You have. Like, I read where there was, you know, some checklist of some guys that was like, all right, if the two girls are wearing their hair in similar styles, they like each other. And if one of them is wearing a bob, they're definitely fucking. Um, (laughs) And it's always the same, right? Isn't it just crazy? It's always the same things over and over and over. Yeah. It's wild. Um, more on, like, you know, if you want to read more on kind of this, like, pathologizing of lesbianism, uh, we've got a, a really great article that we'll put in the show notes. S is for sister, schoolgirl intimacy and same-sex love right. in early 20th century Japan by uh, Gregory Flugfelder. It's really great. And there's a really um, great quote from that one. It's because um, he was talking about the authorities, you know, people who were deciding what was pathological and what wasn't. And he quotes... The, the quote reads, anti-feminists rarely hesitated to claim this diagnostic privilege, even when they were not themselves doctors. And I wanted to go bing, bing, bing <laughs> like that. Yes. Yeah. You you also have at this time, right, like everybody's freaking out about this stuff. Partially also because, I mean, you know, we're skipping a little forward, but, you know, 1930s, you get this, what seems to be because of the media attention, mm. this like rash of like female love double suicides. To be clear, this was also happening cross gender. Right. People were just people were just feeling the immense pressure in a pre-war Japanese society um, and very very rigid roles uh, and arranged marriages and all of this. But you have this this one notoriously publicized incident in 1935 of this like suicide attempt by this theater performer Sayo Eriko and the woman that she was in a relationship with Masuda Fumiko, who was the daughter of this like wealthy Kyoto family. And it basically just it catapulted everybody to talking about this. Yes. Um, and and they were ridiculed in the press, and it was a whole thing. One, one fucking sexologist writes, like, why are there so many lesbian double suicides reported in the society column of the daily newspapers? <laughs> one can only infer that females these days are monopolizing homosexuality. And there's, you know, the thing is, this <laughs> is the same kind of charge of being degenerate that you're seeing a lot. It's being leveled at shoujo, of course, because the shoujo is degenerate because she's so influen- influenceable. And flappers here in the U.S., modern girls, uh, which would be older, maybe college age, women who had traveled the world and come back and found their husbands were boring, uh, provincial and dull and didn't want to get married now. And so, you know, they want to they want to see the world and be part of the world and they're being told no stay home. You get this this charge of deviancy and degeneracy associated mm-hmm. with it. And so the, a, the, a lot of this, I mean, a lot of the the double suicide thing was very much a uh, a media freak out. I remember maybe it was in the 90s when um gals in Shibuya were really hot. It was the, the, mm. the particular the gals, they were putting like heavy makeup on and they were almost girl gangy. Um but they weren't gangs. They were just groups of girls, right? But they were like, "Oh, <laughs> these dangerous degenerate girls." And mostly they just hung out like eating McDonald's and going shopping for, you know, Jewelry. I mean, like they weren't doing anything. They weren't roving bands of girls with heavy makeup on that were like doing like anything. Clockwork right? Orange. You know, <laughs> they. You know, they were just simply being. They were finding the space for themselves. But it, the media kept reporting on them as it being very degenerate, very deviant. Yeah, and you have this, you have a lot of these kind of things leveled at Yoshia Nobuko herself. Mm -hmm. Of Um, course. People called her uh, Garçon, which was uh, a word that was used in, like you were saying, Flapper, um, Moga was, was another one. Yeah, um, Moga was was actually a very fashionable thing, but of course the media would constantly blow it up. And that really is what it comes down to. It's always that the media is going, girls, what are they for if not us? Mm -hmm. And then they get very confused when girls are not for them. Right. And girls, 
were doing their own thing. Yeah. Which leads us to our word of the week. is SU or S. S class or class S or, or S. S. Right. This this amorphous thing um, that nobody can really quite define. I mean, everybody knows what girls. it is, but nobody can say it comes from here. Yeah. So despite sexologists pathologizing queerness, schoolgirls all over it. You know, we talked about the way that this girls culture and these girls magazines really focused on, you know, these in- intimate and ad- admiring relationships between these younger schoolgirls and these older schoolgirls. And while, you know, sexologists are like lumping queer men and queer women together, students are like seeing their lives as completely different because, you know, we're, we're sex segregated in schools and they have separate vocabularies to describe these relationships with their friends, with their, their crushes, essentially. They're intimate friends, um, yes. They're intimate friends. Uh, you have this uh, 1911 article in the Fujin Koran newspaper, which claimed that between seven and eight out of ten women had experienced these same sex relationships between classmates. And at this time, you know, early 1900s, 1910s, you have like different words. They're all very localized to different schools. You mm-hmm. have passionate love, netsuai, or goshinyu, or intimate friends, or okahara. Uh, and, and the okahara. thing is, goshinyu is still a word used. Shinyu is just really? like best. No, nah, that's a really weirdly formal version of it. But shinyu is a word that's like, like you're my best bud. Like you're my, you're the person who has my back because you're shinyu. Oh. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so these aren't words that don't exist outside these situations. But yes, of course, every school develops its own vocabulary. Mm-hmm. Every group develops its own vocabulary. It's absolutely 100% true. If you were a teenage girl, those of you listening, if any of you were teenage <laughs> girls, I bet you immediately remember the group you called, the name you called your group of friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and and how you had your own entirely personal vocabulary. And if you know anything about language, you know that in many cases, those words are created by you so that no one else knows what you're talking about. It's code to keep the outsiders out. Yeah. Um, we see these relationships flourishing in these sex-segregated spaces. This, the same kind of things are happening in these girls' schools as you're seeing in, like, convents, and you're seeing in factories, and you're seeing these places where it's women being allowed to flourish together. Yes. Flugfelder mentions the above expressions, so all of these, you know, different disparate words, all manifested the power of schoolgirls to define themselves and their cohorts in their own terms. A power that adults preferred to keep in their own hands, right? Right. Is, like you were saying, this, this code. By the 20s and 30s, though, you get kind of this proliferation of this term S that starts making its way through all of these other schools across the country, and it's spread through these magazines. So yes, you have this, this adoption of this term through, well, this is this is what we're observing around the country, and we're going to define it in this way and, and cement it in this literature space. Right, yeah. exactly. It's the, the giving that space, ceding that space to girls to define for themselves, you know, and then, then you as a, a girl not in a city reading like, oh, wow, there's this S culture, you know, this is for me, this is for me and my friends, right? So S also developed a artistic aesthetic. And to be very, very, very simple about it, it's girl-centered. And it's about the varying modes of being shoujo. And and I, I want to make it clear, too, like, this is happening in the culture and in the literature, and also it's, like, actually just happening. It is everywhere in these girls' schools. And honestly, Yoshi Nobuko becomes a huge part of transforming that into an entire subculture because it's being disseminated and distributed through the country this way, through these, through these magazines. Um, Absolutely. It starts becoming this huge public concept, this hugely public understanding. So that, like you were saying, these factory workers, these lower class girls who did not have the luxury of being in this liminal adolescent space still were aware of it and still saw that as something that is an option. And and something to aspire to. Exactly. This idea that even though you're not at a fancy French, you know, foreign run private school, that maybe there's somebody who can be your bigger sister here in in your local area and and just you can develop an intimacy with them and really kiss your friends. Yeah, you could maybe kiss your friends. Maybe kiss your friends. Sure. Yeah. Why not? 
Yeah. Usually these stories were depicting, like you were saying, classmates with like an age difference. And yeah, we, we don't really know what S stands for. Sister, shojo, sex, shon, German word for beautiful, escape. Nobody really knows. But adults saw it as a threat. What a so, surprise! Adults saw <laughs> something that girls liked as a threat. That has never yeah. happened in the history of the world. <laughs> no, not at all. Everyone's incredibly respected. <laughs> um, class S literature was like officially banned in 1936 by the Japanese government because of these threats and because of this, you know, oh god, these class S relationships are getting too too intense and too hot and heavy and it's going to turn them into ome relationships. Yeah. Girl schools were even, like, forbidding exchanging these letters among S lovers. The media basically shut this down because, you know, it was so pervasive that, like, but what if it leaves the schools? But you know what? The funny thing is they tried. They certainly got, the media got hysterical and everybody tried to. But you know what? Well into the 70s and 80s, girls were still exchanging, you know, diaries. They probably, probably little kids still do. And writing little messages to each other. It doesn't... None of that goes away. I mean, you can make a law that says there's no way to do this. You must never do this. And then uh, the average 11-year-old doesn't know about the law and doesn't care. <laughs> it's going to do whatever the fuck they feel like. An 11-year-old who's incredibly well-versed in, like, <laughs> in, in a social engineering. Right, like. social engineering. And, and, you know, they really care very much that the government doesn't want them to do a exchange diary with their best friend, which they absolutely are doing. Absolutely are still doing. Um, yeah, I mean, all of this basically boils down just, yeah, male and adult control over these spaces where women and girls have this new form of autonomy. And since these, like, relationships were the domain of these girls themselves, like, we can't really use writings by adults and outsiders and media to, like, gauge the reception of these relationships within their own environments. Flugfelder has a really lovely quote that I thought hit the nail on the head is, the discourses of outsiders can never fully capture the meanings that S held for its participants. And that's apparent in the fact that, like, he interviews former schoolgirls mm -hmm. for this article. And, you know, he tries to talk to them about their memories of their S relationships versus, like, this stigma and negative associations. And they see a complete disconnect. Right. There's this, like, gap in their understanding of that. Yep. So it can only be held, you know, and fully understood by the people who were involved in it. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, it lasted so long. And, I mean, people that I know, people that I have worked with in recent years have told me they went to a girl's school and they had... Uh, one sama and emoto relationships and s was still a word that was used and it was all perfectly well understood even now mm. the thing about s is it can be as simple as you're joined a club and one of the older girls helps you out and becomes like your close confidant or you have your best bud in school or something but it can be more intimate but the intimacy that develops between girls makes adults and particularly adult men fearful mm -hmm. And that's, yeah. that's really what we're talking about. It doesn't have to be defined. Word of the week. Gay word, Gay word of history. All right. Uh, so back to Yoshia. Speaking of feeling frustrated over men and their interpretation of these things, Yoshia had some attitude about marriage and men. I didn't really know exactly where to put this in here, but I had to put it in here, is she wrote an article in 1931, basically just called A Husband is Unnecessary. Right. Because people were saying, oh, poor her, you know. Yeah, she must, she be, must so be so lonely. Don't you want a man around? Wouldn't it be so much easier if... Blah, 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 blah. And she writes, Rest assured, I'm not at all lonely. The outdated notion that an unmarried woman is lonely, bitter, and angry is completely foreign to me. I write novels, which for me is the great work of my life. Completely ignoring the fact that she's got Mon Mochia. Yeah, right? Home. Hello. <laughs> um, uh, for some reason, the omniscient Kami made me a novelist instead of a wife. She also then goes on to say, if the Kami had given me a choice between having a husband and becoming a novelist, I'd choose novelist. Yeah. Gay. Yeah, totally gay. <laughs> I mean, yes. I mean, at the time, of course, the, the joke, and I'm sure Monma and her laughed hysterically because she had a wife of her yeah. own. She didn't have a husband. She had a wife, you know. She was a wife. She, she was, was a wife, wife and she, she had a wife. wife. She had a wife. Yeah. 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 She, there's this letter to Manwa earlier in her career, we mentioned how like a lot of male writers were like, you're not serious literature, we don't care about you. She admonishes these like chauvinist 
writers. She like writes to Monwa really frustrated. She's like, almost to the point of endorsing obscenity, they push on girls the idea that they should be flirting with men. I will do battle with them face to face, <laughs> shouting, Be gone, you demons, and exercise them from our midst. That would be that would have been great. If only yeah. God. Ugh. All right, time to dive into some lady loving with Yoshia. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about Kikuchi? Sure. So Kikuchi Yukia was Yoshia Nabuko's uh, roommate at the YWCA. Oh my God, they were and their relationship was contentious. They had different uh, love languages. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> put it lightly. Put it lightly. Uh, Kikuchi was known as an aggressive and jealous person and, and a partner. There's a um, diary entry from January 25th, 1920. Sex is a most natural human desire. But the irritating thing about Yukia is the way she equates sex with possession and ownership the way men do. The physical act is just a cover for coarseness of spirit. And Yushia's writing, she was very, uh, especially in her writings, her letters to um, Monmashio, clearly they were had a sexual relationship and they both thought it was really an act of beauty and an act mm-hmm. of, of love. And so for Kikuchi to be this way, it was not really her, what Yushia was looking for in a relationship. And Kikuchi made her thoughts known in letters to Yushia about a character from Yanar and Nishoujo being based off her and also her general thoughts on Yushia's career in, she says, in Yanar and Nishoujo, you're described well, but I'm described as if Akitsu is just a doll dressed up beautifully for you. I hate novelists. I hate you too. I wonder if art really has power to heal human solitude and deep pain inside the mind. Please forget about being a novelist. I am so lonely. Um, <laughs> I just really love it. She's like, I mean, your depiction of yourself is great, but you just made me like a play toy. And, you know, <laughs> to some extent, she's not entirely wrong because Akiko right. as a character is fully undeveloped when she shows up and doesn't really see Akitsu as a human. Mm. Because she doesn't see anybody else as a human. She doesn't really see herself as a human. Everybody's sort of a plaything or a, a figure on the wall. You know, it's very—it's a very Plato's cave kind of thing. Um, so when Yoshia breaks up with uh, Kikuchi in 1920, she becomes briefly involved with an older woman at the YWCA. And that all relationship also does not end all that well. She becomes disillusioned. She becomes disillusioned and is talking to a friend about how close friendship between women is impossible. But then the <laughs> friend introduces her to Monmo. Chio, who is three years younger than her, and she was a mathematics teacher. Yeah, she's this this mathematics teacher in a higher girls' school in Kojimachi District. She comes from like a different kind of uh, family background. Yeah, totally than, different class. Uh, everything. Totally different class. Her parents were really, really supportive of her scholarly pursuits and her education, and and so they have this kind of different family background. Monmo Chio's first impression of Yoshia was basically saying like, "Oh, I really like her cute haircut." Mm-hmm. They become inseparable yep. really quickly. Talk about you hauling. Yeah, um, like right away, practically. Right away. They had like every day they're meeting after, you know, Monmachia is like done with work. They're either like hanging out at her house or like, let's go to the bookstores. Let's go book shopping together. So, you know, being attached at the hip, they get really, really tight. And then Monmachio takes a job teaching at a faraway school and they're separated for 10 months. So and they start writing time, letters. In this time, they send a, over 150 letters to each other, like five to 10 page letters to yeah. some of these. Like one of the shortest ones is just this lovely little, it's like a little poem from Nabucco. It's from 1920. It says 1923. So it's like 1923, 1924. This is, this is happening. Beloved Chio, I will love you no matter what. I do not wish to make you lonely, nor do I want to be lonely. I want you to be the source of my strength. And if you will let me, I would like to be the source of your strength. May 23rd, 8.30 p.m. Arriving home soaking wet from the rain. Nobuko. Again, just reminding your audience that even within my lifetime, letters is how we actually did this. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we didn't have phones <laughs> or text or Snapchat. Uh, yeah. This is We didn't tweet each other. We didn't DM each other. We actually wrote letters when I was in college. I used to sit in bat boring <laughs> classes writing very long letters that sound extraordinarily like this to my wife. So that that is how we did That's it once gay. upon a time. So um, That's gay. Yeah, it was totally gay. Let me. Can I read the next one? Absolutely. All right, so in 1923, Monma wrote to Yoshia, I am unspeakably lonely when you leave as I wrap my unlined black kimono around my bare skin. Oh, come on, gay. Uh, and adjust the hem. 
my body aroused by feelings of longing for you. If only on this night we were together in our own little house, lying quietly under the light of a lantern, then my heart would gradually warm and neither would you be so sad. I love that she's like, hey, babe, I'm super lonely when you leave. Also, want to know what I'm wearing? Yeah, right? I'm just adjusting my kimono. <laughs> just adjusting my sexy black kimono. Sexy black kimono. Feeling kimono. aroused. Right. <laughs> Uh, you have this 1924 letter from Yoshia to Monma that is uh, very steamy for a woman oh, who's yeah. not writing a lot about sex in her published writings. I crave your lips. Do you know how much I crave them? When I get into bed alone at night, I begin to burn deeply for you. I am staking my entire life on you, a woman. Every prayer, every desire, every happiness, even my art. I need you and you alone. I have no life without you. Lovely. Oh my god. Yeah, and like, you could tell they're like, they're like so in love with each other. As early as 1925, they're both expressing their frustration in these letters to each other. Basically being like, Duh, society's double standard. What the fuck? Why can't we live together and be married? Monma writes, I can only think of how soon we can arrange to live together. There's nothing I need more than your warm embrace. It's unfortunate that we are not a male and female couple, for if you were a male, our union would be quickly arranged. But a female couple is not allowed. She also says, like, I don't get it. There's so many fucked up things about heterosexual relationships. <laughs> yeah. And, and Yoshia responds that she would wants to build a house for them. Um, she'll declare it a branch household, which is um, has to do with the way names family names are registered. So she would be a branch household of her family, making her head of household and then therefore independent. She'll adopt Monma, which she does eventually. And so she can be legally part of the household. And she says... At that point, she's going to ha want a, a wedding ceremony to celebrate. Um, yeah, she's like, oh, we'll invite our friends, yes. the person who introduced us. She's like laying this out very practically. She's yes. like, all right, one, I'm going to build this house. Two, we're going to do this. Yeah. Three, I'm going to adopt you. Four, we'll have a wedding ceremony. We'll tell everybody that it's an adoption ceremony, but it's a wedding ceremony. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I wonder what kind of wedding kimono would look best on you. Yes. Maybe bring back that black kimono. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Monma, like, agrees to quit her teaching position and, you know, stay around so that she doesn't have to, like, travel far away for work. They basically had that 10 months apart and they're like, never again. And she becomes Yoshia's secretary in 1931. So she does all of the admin for Yoshia. She's, like, editing her writing. They're working together really closely. And this was a nice, you know, even though she never really hit it, it this was, like, the nice public front of, like, hey. It's, it's uh, a yes, writer and we're, secretary. We're, Writer and secretary, business partners. And Yoshia kept her promise to build that house. And she she said that she was going to adopt Monma. And she didn't in, in, you know, the 1920s. Kind of two reasons. You know, Monma's parents were like, absolutely not at first. And also, like, Yoshia wanted to wait until she could actually legally marry her. In that same letter, she's like... And, you know, I'll adopt you. And and in the meantime, we'll get, I'll, I'll work on getting the law reform. I mean, she like, really no, believed that no she could deal. do that, too. She worked really hard. That was one of the reasons she joined the Ben Butai, too, is she really believed that if she was working within the system, that she could change the system. So, you know, the war happens and it becomes pretty obvious after the war that it's not going to happen. That we're, we're not going to be able to legally marry in my lifetime. So damn it, let's do it. So she officially adopts Monma in 1957. And we've seen this with some other relationships. Uh, Bayard Rustin did this with his partner. This is the only way that you can get some sort of legal recognition yeah. of your relationship. Ensure that, you know, your belongings go to your, your loved one when you die. All of this. Which is um, still causing apparently contention. In the family. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. You said that, that Sarah Frederick has been talking with... Uh, with family members. Yeah. With family um, members. But, to, you know, to try to make sure that, that the estate is handled the way the family wants it to be handled. And, and, and apparently, yeah. I mean, it always comes down to that, right? You know, who, who, who inherits the money is always the biggest question. Right. Yeah. And... You know, they live together. She is writing. She's editing her stuff. They have a, a lovely older older years just relaxing in their beautiful home together until Yoshia passes away. And according to at least one or two sources that I found, Yoshia supposedly died holding Monma's hand. Nice. Mer. All right. So we talked about Yoshia's life and queerness in her life. Let's talk about the juicy gay stuff in mm -hmm. her writing. Uh, so the, the, these like general themes of her writing, it's always focused on women. Yes, it um, always is. Yeah, there's this this great quote from Mihu Matsugu, which is, women were the eternal goal of her literature and her life. I love that quote. Yeah. That should be on a gravestone. You know, that's, that's so outstanding. <laughs> Maybe I'll put it on mine. There you go. <laughs> 
Uh, so like in her stories, romantic friendship is, is this unparalleled love that kind of encapsulates and defines this unique space, this liminal space of girlhood. And it's separate from the outside world. So we have this fantasy world, you know, as this special, special place for us is where we can kind of foster this love. Yoshia's own words, she describes girl's love, describes Shoujo as quote, extremely positive in terms of educational value, and it's worth immeasurable. She says it's a necessary step for girls to, quote, develop love as a valuable foundation on which to build one's character. Mm, nice. She also was really frustrated with all of the, quote, unquote, experts and sexologists being like, oh, we're adults. We know what's best for these girls. Yes. And she's saying, no, this shit you're talking about is going to make girls, quote, doubt the purity of their love killing the gentle and beautiful natures of girls which were granted by God. And she was, you know, she insists there's nothing shameful about loving somebody or being loved by somebody, which is really just that it's there. That's there. That's That's it. Yeah. We have some quotes from Hanumanogatari that we thought would be really fun to like pull out. Do you want to talk a little bit about Yellow Rose? I'll I'll talk about Yellow Rose. Um, In one scene we have, um, the thing is it's a student who graduates. So she is, a te- she becomes a teacher, so she is literally one year older or two years <laughs> older than the girl that, that the other girl in the story, because she graduates at eighteen. Now she's, but a few months later, now she's a teacher. So I want to make that very clear that she's not uh, a very adult. She's like maybe eighteen, nineteen years old. Um, so Miss Katsuragi and her student Reiko, who meet on the train. In one scene, Miss Katsuragi tells Reiko about her admiration of Sappho. Uh, Miss Reiko, Sappho was a person who gave her passionate devotion to a beautiful friend of the same sex and was betrayed. Sappho, the tragic female poet, I love her. It's just, it's, it's an incredible story. I really do suggest you read uh, Yellow Rose. And one of the things we can't really express in... <laughs> audio form is the stylization in these stories, Mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of literature on these stories about how the way that it's stylized using ellipses and dashes and pauses is creating this yearning, Mm -hmm. which is very Sappho, very sapphic. This idea of pauses, this this kind of missing things in between. And things Uh, that can't be said, things that are left unsaid is is also very typical in a lot of Japanese stories. mm -hmm. That da 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 can say so much. It's like, it's that unspoken tension. Yeah, that stylization suggests that those two female characters, when they're talking about Sappho, they're actually talking about their love for one another, but it's existing in that space of the things that we're not actually saying. Yeah. Uh, there's another another one, another story in this series, Shaded Flower, that has <laughs> this really great quote is, Two girls learned the sweet taste of forbidden fruits. How can they go back to their old days? This one, I feel like, is like the gayest so far. <laughs> they were wearing a beautiful pink veil called Secret. We are flowers in shade, says Tamaki hesitantly. And when Matsuko puts her arm around Tamaki's shoulder, Matsuko answers, Yes, we are shaded flowers. We only bloom under blue moonlight. Nice. I love it. And you have these tragic endings that happen a lot in Yoshia's works, especially in Hanumanogatari. Yeah, there's a lot of tragic endings in there. But in, in a lot of ways, it's, it's in response to the lack of choice that girls are given. You know, so if, if we're talking about that, that girls are given literally one path, there's one path, and that path is to become a good wife, wise mother, and sacrifice for the family, and then die. And that's the only option given for girls. There's no other option. Um, so it's really a rejection. So there's a, a quote here from um, Suzuki that the tragic endings and the choices are, are seen as a rejection of demands to mature into Rosai Kenbo. Characters refusing to move on to heterosexuality, they're in a continuous state of mourning for the loss of the same-sex world Mm -hmm. you know yeah there's a lot of stories of them just being like but i I don't want to i don't want to leave this 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 world i don't want to leave this world i don't want to leave this world well and that's what you know influenced these double suicides right these are your two options your choices were basically death or marriage then death like you didn't really have a whole lot of wiggle room Which is why it's so remarkable that we have Yoshia being able to live with a woman for 50 years, be financially independent, and breaking this mold, which is what made her... Infamous. And uh, infamous, and also, you know, other women who did not have the financial privilege that she had to be able to do that, looked upon by the media and this uh, this outside world as threats and as degenerates. Yes. Uh, then for Two Maidens in an Attic, right. 1919. Again, you know, this is semi-autobiographical in that she's basing this a lot on her relationship with Kikuchi while at the YWCA. Mm-hmm. 
WCA, but one of the characters sees the other in the bathroom, and it's a very erotically and and romantically charged passage. I want to talk about this for a second. In the steam, fragments of human body appeared and disappeared, soft movement around a round body. A beautiful white arm appeared from the steam and reached toward Akiko. It was Akitsu. She said, let's go to the balcony together. And another passage then later has them smelling each other's lily magnolia scent. Th- that, when you talk about, when you see an anime, for instance, and there's a scene where we're seeing somebody in the shower and there's like all that steam wreath around them, we're still looking at Yoshio Nobuko's influence. I mean, there's a good reason why you call it the progenitor of this entire genre. Right. They end up leaving this attic together at the story, forced to leave this like shoujo world behind, but they decide to forge this new path. In this in this new world, it, there's, there's this quote, kissing the wall of the attic, the two virgins finally left the room in search of their new destiny, in search of the way they should take. Yes, a way that, that violates the requirements and the expectations. Yeah. And then Black Rose, there's this story, A Tale of a Certain Foolish Person, which features through the whole eight-issue run of the magazine. And the reason why I wanted to put something from this in here is that it's kind of challenged some of the conventions because it was focusing on, like, post-higher girl school love. And in this, Yoshia really sort of grapples with this pathologization of same-sex love. She uses the word abnormal in English, which is really, really significant. One of the characters, like, identifies as an abnormal female and has shame about her sexuality. Mm -hmm. She calls it an unnatural passion. But in the same breath is like, but also I couldn't fall in love with a man. That would be even more unnatural. Mm -hmm. You know, she says, Why am I this way? If I keep this up, I will never be able to return to the true path of nature for as long as I live. Aren't you already 22 years old? How long are you going to keep dreaming strange, abnormal dreams? Mm -hmm. And abnormal, very important. It's written out in English. So she is directly referencing this sexological language. Yeah, absolutely. But this character, again, (laughs) another character named Akiko, isn't depicted as like this stereotype of this threatening, like, invert right like this is this is this 22 year old teacher she falls in love with a a 19 year old student basically like she had this previous relationship with a dorm maid in the teacher's school and then had betrayed her sincere passionate love she reports her to the dorm mistress Mm -hmm. to protect her reputation it's basically lost and delirious yeah um if you've seen that And because Akiko isn't described as, like, this, like, masculine woman controlling, she's, like, reluctant to become close to Kazuko to, like, protect her from these negative assumptions. And I really loved this quote saying, you know, she's she's trying to imagine kind of like the way the girls do at the end of Two Maidens in an Attic. She's trying to imagine different ways for queerness as as an option alongside heterosexuality. Mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm. Uh, She says, there must also be a secondary path. Is this not a path that should be allowed for the small number who walk the way of same-sex love? So it it's really significant that she's creating this space of like this identity as something that is just innate and positive and and not deserves its own path. And deserves its own path. And it's not a decadent or degenerative choice. I think it's really important to kind of locate this in the same space as what uh, Radcliffe Hall's The Well of Loneliness right, right. Exactly. is doing in the Western world. We're in this middle middle ground yes. where like queerness is becoming recognized as an innate identity, an innate set of traits. Again, she is very aware of the outside world. She's not living in a bubble, so she's reading stuff widely and she's talking to people from all over the world as she travels and as they come to Japan and as she goes outside of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's 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 not that surprising that she would be firmly aware of other queer writers and their writings, you know. Yeah, she had so much writing. We can't talk about all of it here. We could um, not ever get. We just wanted to pick a couple of choice gay stuff, and also like her older stuff, like after Two Virgins in an Act Attic. It really becomes less overtly queer and is really more about like relationships between women who are choosing not to marry, like or like sometimes like actual sisterhood. But it's all very tinged with this like platonic romantic. Well, she also did a, a story that had been serialized afterwards that was about prof- women be trying to become doctors. And in that yeah. one, there was also a very intimate relationship between two of the women. And ultimately, the one sends the other one away. But the answer is it's she does add that in within her uh, more adult work as well. That female intimacy doesn't just disappear from her work. Yeah. 
All right, so let's talk about some of Yoshia's legacy. You know, we know that she was really well received by every girl who could pick up a magazine and read um, <laughs> during her lifetime. But like, what are the effects of her life and her work and how was she received at the time? And what do we see now? I think it's very much that she was a drop of water and the ripples have just kept going for all these years. And it's just her legacy has not diminished. The quote that I really like is from Sarah Frederick in her article, Not That Innocent, Yoshia Nabucco's Good Girls. She was talking about how Yoshia's uh, magazine sold in the millions. The quote that I just love is, of course, the sheer number of her readers makes her sociologically important. And I just think that is just, it's just a profound statement because these things cannot be overstated. And for someone whose name really didn't get talked about a lot and who a lot of men spent a lot of time, a lot of critics spent a lot of time trying to sort of just dismiss as, you know, who cares? It's girls' literature. I think her influence has just been so, so extensive. Right. Well, and she was in this very specific locus of time yep. where her work and, you know, some other works of, of people who are writing in this, you know, girls' culture sphere, Hanumanogatari made shoujo not just, and here's these couple of years of your life and you're in school and you're having these relationships, but like an entire lifestyle. And an a entire culture. culture. We kind of didn't really get into it, but then her writing was very involved with the new woman movement as well, which was all about women, I, you know, really owning their own identities. Something that could not have happened if shoujo culture hadn't existed for those right. girls to have grown up to women going, oh wait, we as women need to be self-identified. Well, so, I mean, before we go into our, like, how gay were they's in closing, it would be silly to not talk about some pop culture tie-ins with somebody who uh, extremely affected pop culture. <laughs> yeah, so one of the things that happened in the late 1990s is there was a huge resurgence of Class S. So what happened was in the late 1990s, there was a series, there was a series of novels called Maria Sama Gamiturru, which means uh, Maria Washes Over Us. So it's like the Virgin Mary, Maria. And the series was written by a person named uh, Kono Yuki. But the point is in the 1990s, there was this humongous resurgence of S because of Maria Sama Gamiturru, because it was massively popular. So in the middle of that, there's another series that I think we would be remiss if we don't <laughs> talk about, which yes. is called an English revolutionary girl Utena. And... It was a real foundational Yuri story for a lot of people. And so was Maria Samagamitru, which was, they were really contemporaneous, the novels. Revolutionary Girl Utena is not only deeply, deeply rooted in S, but it's actually deeply rooted in Yoshi Nabuko's work, like wholeheartedly. So there's stuff in there that is specific homage to Ryoko Okeda, who did The Rose of Versailles, another series that we really didn't mention, but you should do a whole episode on. Um, <laughs> if you ever want me back, we'll talk about the Rose of Versailles. Um, Hell yeah. And then the thing that I want to point out specifically is at the very end of the movie manga, there's a moment where Anshi turns to Utena, who's sitting in a planetarium, and says, come with me to the outside world. And when I read that, <laughs> I, th like the, the veil fell from my eyes. And I went, holy right. shit, this is all homage. Like, this is all callbacks to stuff that the Western audience had no idea existed at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even things like every time yeah. you watch an anime with shoujo bubbles or, or you see a body wreathed in mist, you know, in, in like a sexy scene in the shower stuff. Piano yeah, duets. Lot. She had a lot. I mean, I picked one out. but She had a lot of that. There were there were a lot of scenes of watching another girl in the in the bathroom yeah, clouded in steam. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. She's got a thing. Uh, she's got a thing for this. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? It's also something she could write. That she could write, right? That's mm. it's it's like what I say about Sappho, and it's the same thing about Yoshia. It's all in the yearning. Yeah, absolutely. As I'm doing the like the chef's hand. The chef's hand is all, it's in, the, all in the yearning. It isn't the yearning, but like uh, in Yuri, you get a lot of weird things that people don't understand. Like, why are they always playing a piano duet? I don't get it. Why is there a piano duet? Why? Yoshia. It's Yoshi and Nabucco. Yoshia. It's Yoshi. Why are they in it. a she room? She loved an attic. She loved a piano scene. She loved to make everything in a Western school. Right, putting it in an exotic school. school. Putting it in a putting the two girls in an attic room or very far away from everybody else Opera. again. 
Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting to see it as kind of like like a reverse exoticization of, yeah. you know, like just so much of Western culture is anytime you look at Asia, it's just like steeped in like gross Orientalism. Yes. And yet you have <laughs> Japanese girls being like, <gasps> English schools, French pianos, teacher, my French teacher, French teacher, addicts. Wow. Exactly. Like it's, it's really interesting how that gets kind of flipped on its head and subverted. But I've written about that actually uh, a number of times on, on my blog and in my book. When Yuri and, and Boys Love came to America, it was very interesting because of course, the Japanese exoticized things by putting them in foreign schools or foreign-run schools, foreign organizational run schools. So now you have Japanese manga coming to America, and that in itself is the exotic piece, and so you get all these fans going, oh, I'm going to use these words like onesama, you know, because it's, it's very exotic. And the fact is they used... English words like the attic, right? At the end of Yana Ura no Nishoujo, where you know, but they're saying goodbye to the attic as opposed to Yana Ura. And the whole point is, it's like, it was their exotic, special, secret place, right? Yeah. Do you know of any media talking about or representing or, or going into Yoshia's life itself? Like, are they, I mean, even just in Japanese, like, are there any documentaries or, you know, has she shown up as a character <laughs> anywhere? Like, yes, yes, actually, I do know. Well, first of all, there is a biography of her in Japanese. Um, and then you read English language works about her and you'll have that as a source. Yeah, right, as a source. And I have not read it yet. I'm still waiting just for Sarah to do it for me. <laughs> very lazy person. But there Sarah wa- Frederick, if you're listening to this episode, which I hope you do, we're yes. very excited for when you publish your biography. Yes, exactly. We can't wait. Um, but there was a manga some years ago, and it was so disappointing that it starts with her leaving to go to Tokyo and then completely ignores everything important about her life at all except the writing. And it, it doesn't talk about just her. Just ignores Mama? Uh, it doesn't Mama even get Gio? to that. It doesn't even get to there. She's just she's oh, just geez. a free and easy moga walking around Tokyo and doing like fun things. And it doesn't talk about her feminist work. It doesn't talk about her liter- You know, it talks about her writing. Ah. And so they managed to completely strip anything important from her life except for her writing and Hanamonogatari. And it was super, super disappointing. And I think, I think they were embarrassed, so it ended pretty quickly. <laughs> Uh, good to know. All right. Well, maybe we won't recommend that one. No, I, I would not. If there's I did something, not. If there's something in Japanese that like our listeners who can read Japanese can read, then hell yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, we're at the end. So, uh, Erica, I know that we've talked about that. The fact that you have that you have listened to the podcast before, so you know what's coming. I do. Is it is time for our how gay were they ratings? So. If you had to rate Yoshia Nobuko on a random arbitrary number scale of whatever categories and things you would like, how gay was Yoshia Nobuko? Um, Yoshia Nobuko was 100 lilies on a scale from 1 to 10. Excellent. I like that. Why lilies specifically as opposed to any of the other 51 flowers from Hanamonogatari? The the word for yuri means lily. Oh, so. That's perfect. Let's see. I think I'm going to give Yoshia, uh, you know, I'll stick, I'll stay with 100 as well. <laughs> you know, just super gay. I mean, just the, the fact that she's, you know, amid this society that's like got sexology coming in and being like, no, 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 no. And she's like, cool, I'm going to sit over here with my butchy haircut and my hot wife yeah, exactly. for 50 years. Uh, but I, I think I'll give her 100 vaguely erotic steam baths. <laughs> <laughs> I think she'd appreciate that. Nice. Nice. Excellent. Uh, well, before we say goodbye, is there anything else that we, we feel like we need to kind of wrap up our thoughts? I, th- I mean, I think we've been kind of saying saying what we need to say all through. We talked about it in our pop culture tie-ins, too. Yep. Um, this has been a really fun convo. It has, actually. <laughs> um, I cannot overstate how important to girls literature and therefore girls comics and then therefore yuri literature and comics yoshia nabuku was and is and i wish we had more of her media in english just so that western fandom had a sense of the literary and artistic history 
mm-hmm. of the stuff mm-hmm. that they are reading. And this is what I do almost all my lecturing, and this is entirely what my book is about. And that's the very reason why we don't know a lot about her in Western thought was a deliberate erasure of she was in her lifetime received very negatively by male critics Mm -hmm. with the power and being able to cross the gap of getting translated coming over into like western canon was very dependent on that it's 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 just it's very much you know that only men write literary works and that's why these are the people we, we translate but but you know but because it's genre fiction made for girls then you know it's like calling Mary Shelley genre fiction. Right? Exactly. Like, and yes. Yeah, Mary, Sh- yeah and yes. Mary Shelley did write horror and it was genre fiction and it was era defining. Yeah, right. And I mean, <laughs> so there you, know, you go. Exactly. Also queer. Also. Hmm. Another podcast for another day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you so much, Erica, for hanging out for like three hours. With <laughs> That's no problem. Me. I know. Um, and talking with me and sharing all of your wonderful expertise. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hopefully uh, at some point just getting like a total download from you on what Yuri I should prioritize. Oh, oh can I education. can I just say that there's an anime that started <laughs> today. It's on Crunchyroll called "I'm in Love with the Villainess." Absolutely. I saw that manga when I was in Japan well, you a should, couple weeks ago. You should totally... Well, you First of all, everybody should read the manga. Everybody should read the novels. Read the novels. Holy shit, read the novels. So it starts off gay, but then ends up queer. That's all I'm going to say. Really okay. amazing. And the anime just started today. Please, please, please go watch it. Tell Crunchyroll you love it and that you want the Blu-ray box set with the extras. Excellent. Okay. All right. Listeners, you have uh, you have a mission. Okay. Um, well, Erica, where can people find out more about you and your work, your writing? What are you doing these days? Well, you can always find me at my blog, Okazu, O-K-A-Z-U, Okazu. It's full of my thoughts about various Yuri anime manga and related media that I want you to immediately run out and go... Uh, watch. I wrote a book called By Your Side, The First 100 Years of Yuri Anime and Manga. It has all of my thoughts all about much of what we've talked about and, and how it all went out from there. So um, I hope everybody will pick that up. It's the first and only book about the history of Yuri in English. And um, you can find me on Twitter for as long as that's still existence. <laughs> um, so I'm at Okazu Yuri. I'm on Blue Sky as Okazu. And I'm on Mastodon as Erica Friedman at Mastodon Social. And I'm Lee, as usual, when I'm not nerding out about old-timey queer folks or diving into the yearnings. (laughs) I'm usually talking about comics, queer TV, various things over at A Paradox in Flux on Twitter, and, uh, you know, crying about Xena episodes on my couch. History is Gay podcast can be found on Tumblr at History is Gay podcast, Twitter at History is Gay pod. You can always drop us a line with questions, suggestions, or just to say hi at History is Gay podcast at gmail.com. I love getting messages from folks. And if you enjoy the show and want to support us in continuing to make it, you can support us on our Patreon. As a patron, you get access to our super secret Discord server where we have fun convos, Sappho's Salon mini episodes where we treat you to love letters and poems from queer historical faves, pop culture tie-in live watches, and queer history trivia nights. As of recording, we did one last night. It was really, really fun. We had a blast. A lot of people showed up, and it was just a really lovely time to get to know everybody. You get discounted or free tickets if you're a patron. We'd have exclusive merch and more. You can become a patron by going to the support section on our website, or just go straight to patreon.com slash historyisgay and join the ranks of our patron community of lovely queerlings, along with the amazing August Red, Thea Precht, Ash Jimmo, Iario or Lario, I could not tell, Michaela, Connor, and Heather. Thank you all so much. We couldn't do this without you. You make wonderful things happen in this space. You can get merch at our store. Click on shop. You know the deal. And lastly, remember to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. It helps more people find the show and we can get more wonderful queer links into our awesome community. Erica, would you like to help me close out the show? Certainly. All right. That's it for History is Gay. Until next time, stay queer and stay curious. Bye.